Wi-Fi Sheep is proud to partner with PCBWay.com. New registered members get their first 10 PCBs free, plus a $5 welcome voucher. Visit PCBWay.com and click on the New Here tab. Then enter some basic details to register. Visit PCBWay.com today. Way back when I first started Wi-Fi Sheep, one of the first videos I did was an introduction to the PyTube Direct for the BBC Micro. For those of you who remember that video, it was actually this BBC Master 128 that I demoed the CoPro on. And what it is, it's a Raspberry Pi coprocessor adapter plate for the BBC Micro. Now, at the time, I was inundated with people fascinated by this, and it's one of our highest rating videos here on Wi-Fi Sheep. Well, three years later, and it's time to um, revisit the CoPros and maybe give my slightly tired BBC Master 128 a little bit of a uh, refurb and some TLC. Especially as this weekend, that's July the 20th, 2019, I want to take this computer out to Bletchley Park and the Milton Keynes Raspberry Pi Jam. So in today's video, we're going to look at doing a bit of TLC work with the BBC Master 128. And I'm going to fit it with an internal version of the PiTube Direct board, as there's now a number of manufacturers who have designed and produced these boards for the BBC Micro range. We'll start by taking a quick look at the original PiTube Direct working with this earlier BBC Micro 32K Model B. This PiTube Direct module fits into the 40-pin tube interface, which is found under the machine. It's best to place a piece of tape over the metal bolts and screw heads in this area so they don't come into contact with the PCB and cause a dead short. The PiTube Direct module, complete with a Raspberry Pi Zero, then neatly fits unnoticed under the machine. And when the machine is powered up, the boot prompt recognises the PiTube and loads in a second virtual 6502 coprocessor, as well as doubling the available RAM from 32 to now 64K. Now let's look at the slightly larger BBC Master 128. The 128 kept most backward compatibility with the Model B, including the 40-pin tube interface. Unfortunately, due to the case redesign, the Pi Tube Direct module's not able to fit under the machine, and hence why we need to look at fitting a board internally. So, I ordered this off eBay, and it actually came very well packed. This is an internal coprocessor for the Raspberry Pi that you fit inside the BBC Master. Actually comes with quite a very nice instructions and the FX key commands here, so that's really nice to have. Always very good quality from this particular seller. Uh, you'll notice inside, if I show you that, the parts are actually taped inside the envelope. Oh dear. I think it's just time to rip the envelope to get this out, I think. There we go. And this one actually comes in a kit form for a little bit of self assembly. Okay, we'll just use a knife just so we can get in to the packet. Nicely provided in an anti static bag. And here we have the custom PCB. Let's hold that the right way around. So there you are, BBC Master Raspberry Pi adapter. Really nice quality board. By the way, if you're interested in how boards like this are actually made, how you get your own professional boards produced, do go over and check out our new partners. That's PCBWay.com. Now, as I mentioned, there's a bit of assembly with this one. It's not too difficult. The bulk of the parts are already assembled. So as you can see, we've already got the header. The 40 pin head is already attached to the board. That's been really nicely and professionally soldered on. So all we need to do is attach these two single line headers, one to each side. Yep, so we have to apply this two pin link here into this socket which says Pi Power. Again, this is really simple stuff. This is not difficult to do. Make sure we've got some flux. Solder, soldering arm, which is just off camera here, warming up at the minute. So I think we'll start with 
two pin piece, which is not difficult, so there it is. I'll just literally dip the end into some flux. Sometimes holding the things upside down can be tricky. Make sure it's in. So sometimes I just use a screwdriver end to dip it in the flux and just apply a little bit of extra flux. Shouldn't really have to do that, but um, or need to do that. And if you do, probably shouldn't use a screwdriver. But... So we we'll give ourselves a bit of solder nearby. Let's see if we're up to temperature yet. We might be. And it's just a case of tinning the ends like that. And there we go, that's actually now on. Perfect. Okay, so I'm going to turn my attention to one of the ends now. So, simply just trying to get this to line up. And kind of important to try and keep it as straight as possible. So, just run some flux over the joints. Boy. Try to keep this relatively straight without bending the pins. So I'll just case just going over, make sure we've got good contact without bridging the pins. What you don't want to do is put too much solder on it bridges these pins. That's actually looking okay. Okay, so pretty much the same with the other side. Just make sure we're in. And again, I'm just going to carefully run a bit of flux. Down the outside. You may notice there I actually bridge those two by accident, so it's not a big deal if that happens. Obviously try and avoid it where you can, but you can just heat up and remove the excess if necessary. Now let's take a closer look inside the Master 128. A few years ago we did a full 128 rebuild video here on Wi-Fi Sheep, so we won't go over all the work required to get one of these fully working today. But just to point out, this machine has a new video NUALA graphics card fitted, again this was shown in a previous video. The main PSU was serviced as these have a tendency to go bang and emit smoke in their old age. And the old leaky CMOS backup batteries were also replaced. So you'll notice here that on the BBC Master PCB you've got two sockets, one here and one here. And these hopefully will line up with the pins on the expansion board. Now obviously I have got the NULA video card Fitted and that does overhang in the space for this however I'm hoping this will sit on top so making sure we are actually the correct way around and of course your computer is actually off we'll mount that in there so we can get the other pins to marry up on the other side and there we go no problem at all PiTube Direct requires a Raspberry Pi board to act as the main coprocessor. The natural choice for this is the Pi Zero, but I do have a few older spare Pi boards somewhere. Ah, here we are. This 2014 A Plus board will do nicely, even with its limited 256 megabytes of RAM and slower 700 megahertz single core ARM processor. This A Plus will be more than capable of handling the copro requirements. Plus it has the added advantage of having a 40 pin GPIO header already installed. As with any Pi, the A Plus still requires a micro SD card. This 32 gig card is admittedly overkill as you can get away with as little as 2 gig, but it'll do for now. The new micro SD card needs to be placed into an adapter and placed into your Mac or PC. 
Here on the Mac, we need to navigate through to Disk Utilities, normally found under Applications. We then need to erase and reformat the card to FAT DOS format and name the card Pi Boot. It's important to use FAT or FAT32 and not XFAT or NTFS formats as these won't work with the Pi. Now we need to get hold of the required software for the Pi. Search PiTube Direct GitHub and look for Hoglet67. From here, click on the Code tab and then from the second row, click on Releases. Scroll down to the zip link for the latest Egg Eater release and click Download. Now find the zip file on your computer and open or extract the contents. The final stage is to simply copy and paste all the files in the zip to the root directory of the SD card. Normally for most Pi distros this method won't work as the files have to be flashed as an image file but as we're not booting off the Pi and it's acting as a slave copro to a BBC Micro this method is fine to use. Ok so we're now back at the main BBC Master board. So just make sure that the machine is off and that the copro adapter board is in. Now we can take the Raspberry Pi and placing it upside down we should now firmly connect the pins of the GPIO into the socket. And that will hold like that and that actually looks all good. Um, some people have asked about the uh, viability of running a Raspberry Pi upside down because obviously the thermals of the processor it wants to either run sideways or should be the other way around so heat can lift off the chip. The chip is now running upside down. I don't think in this it's going to be too much of a problem as even for a Pi, an A plus Pi like this or a Pi Zero, the workload required for the Raspberry Pi board, the processor itself, to emulate all these different chipsets isn't really going to be very taxing. So I don't think heat and thermal is going to be too much of a problem in this assembly. OK then, so with the CoPro now fitted, let's power up the Master 128 and see if it's all worked. Ah, the reassuring twin beep. And we've got a screen prompt. Just need to hit break to soft reset the machine. And as we can see, the computer has detected the Pi and like we saw with the Model B earlier, it's showing a virtual second 6502 processor with 64K of RAM ready for use. So let's put the case lid back on, checking it still fits with all the new PCBs inside. And yep, all looks good. OK, final test. Let's try some vintage CoPro software. For this, I'll need to attach my modded Amiga 3.5 inch floppy drive. Let's start with one of the very few CoPro games for the BBC Micro, the enhanced version of Elite. And yes, that all looks to be working fine with the virtual second 6502. Let's try stepping up a gear. I can call the Raspberry Pi by using FX commands from the BBC Micro. This statement will change on the fly the coprocessor from a 6502 to an Intel 8286 and loads in 896k from the Pi's RAM to use on the system. This in turn gives us an IBM PC compatible environment as one of the first things we can do is load DRDOS from floppy disk. With a full DOS operating system up and running, we can even boot a fully working version of Gem Desktop, an early graphical user interface which competed with Microsoft Windows and was also used by Atari for their ST range of 16-bit home computers. Now, for those of you that are actually interested in CoPro software and what's actually been developed in the hobby community for the PiTube Direct and the BBC Micro, very shortly on this channel, I will go over looking at some of the software 
from the past and also some of the brand new things and features you can do. But until then, as ever, thanks so much for your company. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you real soon right here in the channel. Until next time, bye for now.